Good evening, everybody. It is a pleasure again to present the second session of the three debates or conversations on different subjects that are held uh, here in, in Ivory Press, uh, Art and Gallery, uh, Art Gallery and Books, as we describe it now, Elena, um, which will be on the subject of economics. Yesterday we discussed art, and tomorrow we discussed, uh, we discussed sustainable matters with uh, our two guests here, who I hope will enter into the discussion at the end, because, of course, uh, sustainability and economics are so closely linked that I suspect that uh, there will be many things that you will want to raise. But today it is my pleasure to present uh, Ricky Bourdet, um, an architect and, uh, and someone who introduced uh, architecture in the London School of Economics, besides being now the main advisor for the Olympic uh, Games in in, in London, who will speak first. Then, in this world of uh, architects, we needed a real economist, and so we found uh, uh, Jordi Gual from Barcelona, who is also an academic, a professor, uh, 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 um, who's been trained in Berkeley, and now is the chief uh, economist of, of Caixa in, in Barcelona, as I said. And finally, we'll end up with a sociologist, Saskia Sassen, um, who is a professor in Colombia, who also teaches in the London School of Economics, like, uh, like Ricky Bourdet, and who will uh, make a presentation on, uh, on cities and, and the economy, something which is very close to uh, the interests of us all. And I want to say now, just in case I don't forget at the end, that once we have finished everything, Saskia will be very pleased to sign her books in the bookshop. So if any of you want to uh, um, polish your uh, knowledge of uh, her subjects, you are invited to buy her books, and she'll be, kind, she'll be very glad to sign them for you. So uh, with this, we we'll start, uh, Ricky. Uh, it's fantastic being here. It's a bit like being in sort of my front living room with Elena, Norman, and Saskia. Uh, and that's a, you know, that's a compliment, to be here with friends. This is, of course, incredibly scary uh, to talk in front of uh, uh, old friends and uh, new, new friends about a subject that I care passionately about. But what I'm going to do is um, take Luis's um, brief, slightly ignore it, because I'm not an economist, and try and help set a context to any discussion that one can have about the relationship between architecture, which I really think of as built form, uh, and economics, by which I very much think about the wider social economic dimension. So that's very much where I want to uh, place my talk. And in so doing, I will be referring to a lot of the research that I've done, in fact, with Saskia, Richard Sennett, and others at the London School of Economics. I don't think we can talk about any of these issues to do with the built environment and what happens to society at large without reminding ourselves of this extraordinary statistic. I know many of you know it and have seen it, a uh, hundred times, can we have the, yeah, uh, which is that only a hundred years ago, just remember that, that's when my grandfather was alive, 10% of the world's population was living in cities, it's now 50%, and if things go according to plan, that is the United Nations plan, it could be that by the time my son is my age, think how soon that is, I mean to put it uh, in a concrete way, 75% of the world will be 75% uh, of the world's population will be living in cities. Now, why is this important in this debate? Because it's that stuff over there on the bottom left-hand side, the built environment, which uh, concentrates human capital and concentrates jobs. And I think uh, an awareness of the types of environments we make on these two issues is what I'm interested in. These are my only bullet points. Saskia has more but we share the same typeface. And this is just to say, what is the argument that I, in a way, want to try and share with you? And hopefully we can debate it um, later. I mean, first of all, let us remember that cities uh, do concentrate by far the vast majority of global investment and human capital and jobs. So cities are about people and money. And the decisions made about that, I think, are significant. People move, and we'll hear more about that, to cities. They are the magnets of global migration. But like a friend of ours, uh, the wonderful writer Suketu Mehta, in his superb book called The Maximum City, describes Mumbai, this many ways horrible place, yeah, as a bird of gold, 
as a place where young people, particularly from other parts of rural India, come because they can come in at the bottom and then rise up to the top. We've all seen uh, the slumdog millionaire. It's slightly banal, but it tells you what that life is like. Cities have been and will continue to be the places where opportunity happens. And of course, they're made up of buildings. I'd say that something like 70, 80 percent of cities are made up by private capital, people who invest in buildings to get some return over time. But one of the arguments that I think I would like to share with you is that I'm convinced, the more we work on these issues, that the design of buildings themselves, the actual structure, and this room proves the point, I'll come back to that, and the spaces in between buildings can either actually support or negate the sort of flexibility in the economy which allows um, different economies and different structures to actually respond to the sorts of situations we've seen now. I mean, this was a printing works, it's now a gallery. It could be something else. There are many buildings which are being designed, obviously not by Norman, uh, which can't change or, or are stuck with one use. And I think the notion of Richard Sennett's flexible capitalism and flexible architecture is very important to us. A final couple of points I really think we need to stress is that we tend to talk about the environment because we're architects, planners, politicians, economists, from the formal point of view, that everything is designed. Someone sits in a room, uh, number 10 Downing Street or the White House and makes a decision. Most cities, and we'll look at that, are actually informal. Most cities in the world where growth is happening more intensely are informal. 60% roughly of Mexico City is informal in terms of its economy and in terms of its built form. So what do we say about that? And here I respond to Louise's uh, question in a way to us. What does the profession say about this? And I think there is extraordinary naivety amongst the design professions and their educational structures about understanding the impacts of uh, design and total ignorance of the informal sector. And I think these are issues that need to be taken on board. But again, let's stand back briefly and recognize the fact that cities are the center, the nodes, as Saskia has written about, enormously of human capital, uh, but also flows of money, flows of people, and uh, the intersections of what happens. And an image I've used many times, I think, actually summarizes, this happens to be Caracas, what happens on the ground. On the right, this is the world of investment of private capital. Unfortunately, it's also the world where most architects tend to reside. Pretty ugly buildings. Most architects build ugly buildings. Uh, most of them stop thinking about their site where the owner's land ends, don't think about anything else. Most transport planners do transport planning and don't think about how they're severing actually relationships between others. And in the case of this area here, the largest slum as it happens in South America, this is what people do. So architects, private capital, transport planners, and people. And I think it, this is the center of the debate about uh, the economic impact of uh, cities. You know, th this is uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, this is what's happening in India today. This is the scale of change that we're talking about. This is Shanghai, which is a city which is changing at a very fast speed. And I want to actually bring it back to even London. This is Zaha Hadid's beautiful aquatic center for the Olympics. Ultimately, the Olympics in London is an excuse, I would call it. There's a map of London to try and transform a problematic uh, area from the social and economic point of view, problematic for the last 100 years, not the last 20 years, to invest 9.3 billion euro, uh, 9.3 billion pounds, so roughly 12 billion euros of public money into an area which I'm beginning to become convinced, but I would, wouldn't I because I'm part of the gang, will probably make a difference to rebalancing the east and west of London. Roughly put, for those who don't know London, West is rich and East is poor. And the fact that there will be transport, a wonderful park, and new housing there is absolutely important to, I guess, literally the economy of the city. But where is this growth happening and what is happening underneath the skin? This graph just shows you very simply where cities were in the darker color at the bottom in 1950. So there's Tokyo, for example. There's New York. In the last uh, 50 years, roughly, in yellow, you see how they've grown. So Tokyo shot up to nearly 35 uh, million. 
But in blue, you see where cities are going to grow according to the United Nations in the next um, uh, nearly 15, 20 years. Now, what immediately is clear from that, and I think central to this discussion, is that most of the growth is happening in areas of the world, Africa, parts of India, Southeast Asia, and also still in South America, which are at the bottom end of the scale. So the questions become, are we creating cities which make worse the social divide, the difference between rich and poor, or actually do something to flatten them out? And I am absolutely convinced that architecture is part of that discussion. Cities, it's interesting in the work we do, we won't go through this, but you know, there's an economist here, so I have to show a graph. Right? Um, cities, if you just look at, the, this is New York in blue and this is London over here, their turnover as uh, cities is the same as the whole nation of Turkey or Mexico. So the power of a city, obviously an advanced economy, purely in terms of finance, is absolutely significant. And some of the things we've looked at at the LSE is look at the concentration of people, uh, the density, literally, of how many people live close together. And clearly, this means jobs and the ability to actually create activity. Now, cities always do better than their nations when it comes to the amount of money that they produce per person. This is quite interesting. It just takes the population of a, a city, like Istanbul, and relates it to the amount it contributes to the gross domestic product. So uh, Istanbul has roughly 18% of the population, but it contributes to 22%. Shanghai, fascinating, only 1% of the population contributes to 5%. So there's something about being together, uh, we'll hear more about this, which actually is significant. Inter it is intriguing that the one exception is Berlin, and I don't want to be unkind to my German friends, but it's an artificial city. It's a city which actually, despite having a relatively high population, the efficiency is uh, much less noticeable. And you look at the relationship between cities and their nation in terms of how much people earn. There again, take New York. The average income in New York is $53,000. In average income in the United States is 44000 And again, with the exception of uh, Berlin, uh, you see that that pattern actually happens elsewhere. So cities have this capacity to really concentrate wealth, and proximity, I think, is an essential uh, component of that. Different cities have different physiognomies when it comes to labor markets and their economic impact. Most of the cities of the West, like London, like New York, to a degree, of course, Madrid, have, um, are no longer large manufacturing areas. These were the Docklands in London a number of years ago and have turned into centers of service industries, insurance, banking, and everything else. I think that is set to say. Officially today, Mervyn King, the, the governor of the Bank of England, said that England is already out of the recession. It's hardly a year has passed. Have, you know, how, have we noticed it? And why people come to cities, and this is the city of London, the financial hub of London itself, is the same in London as it is in Mexico City and elsewhere. Basically, to get work. And I think that is an element that needs to be really underlined and understood. What we've done is compared, for example, it's difficult to see probably from the back, the um, economy, the urban workforce of a number of cities, which you see here. And on the left-hand side, you see this word services, which means, as I say, banking, insurance, and everything else. And you find that uh, most of these cities have a very, very high percentage in services, um, which is completely different still from vastly growing cities like Istanbul, like uh, Shanghai, like Mumbai, where instead the industrial sector, manufacturing over there is still very different, uh, is very strong. So while Pudong in Shanghai is growing at this fast pace, its uh, DNA is very much dependent on the manufacturing workforce as it is in Mumbai. Now, going quickly to the point about the informal sector, this is research just done very recently by uh, my team at the London School of Economics. Just look at these figures. Mumbai has 68% of its economy as informal, what you might call the black economy. Uh, it's also one of the fastest growing cities in the world. So the question is, what are you designing for? It's sort of shifting sands. And I think we, as a profession, need to engage in that. Mexico City is nearly 50%. I mentioned that before. Even Istanbul, entering the European Union in a few years from now, hopefully from their point of view, 
is uh, 30%. And so the story goes on. And why? Why is that happening? Because this guy will earn probably three times as much by selling peanuts at a traffic light than he will by working in the fields in a sort of remote district. And that's why the landscape of many of the cities that we've been studying together uh, shows so much of this informal street vendors, uh, people who have to sort of adapt and respond to conditions that you see here. This is in Johannesburg. Now, a couple of points before I begin to draw to some conclusion that I want to dwell on. I think the relationship between physical form, as I've said, and social exclusion is very strong. And clearly, uh, there are different patterns by which that can happen. We've done some studies which are, I think, quite interesting between many cities, but I'm just going to focus on London and New York, which show two interesting things. The darker colors in these two maps, there's London uh, with the River Thames, there's uh, New York with Central Park right over there. Uh, the darker colors show where there is concentration of deprivation and unemployment, basically poor, poorer people. And it's interesting, you see, in London, not surprisingly, a lot of it is in East London, but there are some pockets over here, a lot of it in South London. In uh, New York, there's concentration in the Bronx, in Queens, and in uh, some outlying areas. Uh, notice that quite a lot of central Manhattan, with the exception of Harlem, there is incredibly well off. Now, if you do exactly the same thing to ethnic groups, people who come from different backgrounds, in London, there's actually, there isn't a one-to-one -one correlation. These are Indians living actually a very well-off area of Southall and West London. Uh, there are some Japanese people living over there. Uh, they're uh, very well off area here uh, on the west near Heathrow Airport, and so the story goes on. Unfortunately, in New York, there's probably more of an equation between those who are well off and those of a different uh, ethnic background. So there's the Bronx, there's Harlem, and there are pockets of Queen. Now, what we've been seeing over the years is uh, as cities grow and evolve, that, that difference um, of ethnic background and uh, social income is becoming literally cast in stone. There are whole neighborhoods of Mexico City that you can't have access to. And I think one of the issues behind the riots in French cities in the last years, particularly in the banlieue, has been about, as our uh, sociologist friend from um, uh, Sophie baudijon has written um, about, many of the problems in the banlieue have been that one typology of build form mainly 70s housing, has been occupied by one group of people, mainly immigrants, and who left there and abandoned and not sort of taken care of. So we have enormous responsibilities. Now, because of time, I'm going to go through things very, very quickly. But some of the work that we've done show how a city like New York has changed absolutely dramatically in the last sort of 40 years. New York had nearly 30% of its population only 40 years ago involved in manufacturing. Look what it is now. It's only 4%. So the question becomes, and this is the architectural question, what do we do with the buildings? How do we uh, respond to that? And I think this is here where the resilience of built form and the resilience of the economy might be connected. This is a sort of, let's call it a working hypothesis. Well, this is one of the sort of typical areas along the fringes of New York, um, in fact, near the Bronx. I'm sorry, um, in, in Queens. Um, and this is what these old buildings look like. Well, you won't be surprised that these have been turned into rather trendy condos, just like this space here has been turned into a trendy art gallery, bookshop, etc. Now, I know, and I think many of you will know, that these buildings here, which happen to be, uh, but it could be Battery Park, it happens to be parts of uh, Pudong in China, cannot be readapted, cannot change when the economy changes. And I think, therefore, designers need to be connecting much more to this issue. In Shanghai, as elsewhere, you have these extraordinary statistics, a city which uh, only in 1980, so 30 years ago, had 121 buildings over eight stories high, now has over 10,000. Well, what's being designed to replace these spaces? This. This is the landscape that we are creating. And apart from its social impacts, I think the economic impacts of this are dramatic. I'm going to conclude with um, Johannesburg and then say one more thing, Luis, so I'm nearly there. Johannesburg, I think, is probably the most dramatic impact in terms of change brought about by abandonment uh, and by what I would call economic recklessness. 
What we found is that in the city center, which is you know, as attractive as many others, it doesn't particularly have any problems, in a city which had been racially divided by design, let's not forget that, by political design, not by impact, what has happened there is that in the last uh, 20 years only, um, the central business district has just been completely abandoned. From 69% of all the companies there, it's only down to 22. And that is simply because uh, fear has built into uh, the city center, which has been taken over by uh, drugs, crimes, and everything else. The authorities have given up. All the banks have moved out. All the big corporate uh, uh, institutions have moved out to these horrible <laughs> out-of-town uh, developments or suburbs, really leaving the city to its own uh, devices. And this is what the city center now looks like. So I think, again, I'm trying to reconnect these issues. Let me end by bringing it back down to architecture and money. Uh, there's a Chilean architect called Alejandro Aravena who's nearly taking this whole issue that I've been talking about from the other end, which is the building block of housing. And he's worked out that in Chile at the moment, if you take a government grant or a World Bank grant, you can build this for $7,500. And he's actually used his ingenuity, ingenuity as a designer to come up with that for effectively the same amount of money. Now, why? Because he's worked out a frame, which is resilient and flexible, which is that. You build that, then over time you build another level. And as you see, it has a lot of empty spaces in between. It recognizes that these families will need the informal sector to support it, that they will end up building uh, something else to rent or to do more work. So what happens is that the informal sort of takes over. This is what these areas now look like. They're incredibly successful, so much so that the Chilean president is now launching this program across the world. So I think the micro scale of decision, of design, is as important as the macro scale when it comes to understanding society, architecture, and economics. Thanks very much. Well, good evening. It is an honor and a pleasure to have the opportunity to join such a prestigious panel and be able to discuss with the leading figure of modern architecture, such as Lord Foster, uh, the relationships between economics and architecture. I will have no PowerPoint presentation myself. This is risky. My presentation could be powerless and pointless. I hope, I hope that will not be the case. I decided to write it down to make sure that I spend my 15 minutes in front of architectures wisely. Professor Galliano uh, gave to us sort of a memo indicating a few ideas that could structure today's debate. Among them, he said that uh, architects were notoriously reluctant to think of their work in economic terms. This reflects how dominant the view of architecture as an artistic field is. And I would like to argue in this talk that this is a serious mistake, that architects, architecture has a huge social and economic dimension, and that architects stand to gain a lot, tremendously benefit, from incorporating into the teaching of architecture and into their thinking some of the main ideas from economics, the dismal science. Much as economics stands to gain from interacting with the methods of other sciences. So, why is it that economic perspective can help architecture? What is it that economics brings to uh, the architectural profession? Economics, the dismal science, is the science of scarcity. Lord Robbins, himself from the LSE, uh, used to put it this way. He said, it's the science that studies human behavior, collective or individual, regarding the achievement of ends with scarce means that have alternative uses. It is therefore, therefore a discipline that forces you to think systematically about the trade-offs that you face in any decision. In this short statement before the debate, I will try to illustrate how an economic perspective that highlights the trade-offs that you unavoidably face can help 
architectures taking better decisions. And I plan to do this uh, short, in a short presentation by focusing on what I call the business level and the economy-wide level. That is, by showing how it can help the work of architects within their studios and by considering how thinking in this way can help uh, the assessment that architects do of their impact of their work in society at large. Let me start first with the business level. Architects should think of their studios as firms, I believe, for at least two reasons. First of all, because any architectural project, at the end of the day, has a final client that has a limited budget, has a budget constraint. And any architectural project involves a complex, the complex engagement of qualified human resources that could be doing something else and therefore are costly. Admittedly, an architectural project can have uh, aesthetic beauty that goes beyond the economic value. And architects may love the way the work they, they do. And they may be willing to go the extra mile but that can take you only so far. Making sure that the proper service is provided to the client and that the resources employed in the process earn the appropriate return is the essence of business. And there is no harm at all in recognizing that. To the contrary, I think that being methodic and transparent about it will improve the quality of the work and most surely the quality of the work experience. The service will be better and preparing, doing the work will also be better. Secondly, I believe that thinking systematically about the business model will help architects deciding what type of architecture they want to do. Thinking about the choice of business model involves thinking about trade-offs, the essence of economic reasoning. The first trade-off that uh, you face is determining the minimum efficient scale that you need if you want to be involved in certain types of architectural projects. To compete in international uh, competitions, public or private, you need to have a certain dimension. This is usually associated, as with many other professions, with the transition from craftsmanship to the industrialized approach. It involves several organizational changes, streamlined production methods, innovation in terms of design materials linked to the building process, international diversification, internal controls related to budget, to timing. I think that this professional view, business type of organization is very important when companies grow because the architecture business becomes riskier the fixed cost of operating become high relative to the variable cost, the ones that are related to the level of activity, and this is a business where demand is very volatile and can lead to trouble uh, to certain companies at times. The second important trade-off that uh, architecture firms face, I believe, is between volume and quality. As with many other artistic disciplines driven by talent, architecture has come to be dominated by what sometimes is called superstar architects, women and men that command global demand for their services. They create landmark buildings and developments. As with sport or with rock stars, demand is global and focuses on the privileged few at the top. Better communications, the internet, broadcasting have increased over the years the dominance of these uh, individuals, of these professionals. A phenomenon, by the way, which is not so new. Already more than 100 years ago, the classical economist Alfred Marshall pointed out this fact. But of course, media have uh, led to uh, this uh, phenomena to unforeseen magnitudes. To give you just an example, the top golfer, Mr. Tiger Woods, 
makes about 30 times as much money as the professional golfer that is number 50 in the world ranking. Uh, you, you probably don't know this guy. Uh, his name is Mr. Stephen Ames, a Canadian player uh, that, I tell you, is a very, very good player. It is no mean feat to be among the top 50 in the world in a sport that is played by thousands of professional amateur players. Still, he makes one thirtieth of what Mr. Tiger Wood makes. Tiger Wood is a superstar. But is architecture like that? I don't think so. As opposed to other pure artistic disciplines or to sport, in architecture, the production and delivery of the service are not intertwined. They do not go together. I gather in architecture it is not sufficient with the concept, with the idea, with the drawing, with the model. Delivering the final service, I understand, the complete building, the complete development involves a complex process that needs the collaboration of very many people. If you allow me the comparison, it's like if Tiger Woods had to control all the TV channels that broadcast his performance, right? In architecture, to serve a global market, talent has to be associated with management leadership. Because increasing volume while maintaining quality requires the development of a complex organization of professionals, partnership sometimes, and it is crucial to attract high quality individuals and maintain the motivation to make sure that the high standards are maintained in the overseeing and the execution process. Leadership means the development of firm culture, the attraction and retention of talent, and I guess this is very hard in professionals, particularly professionals which are close to the artistic field. Let me now move on to the second part of my remarks, which has to do with the impact of with how economics can help when uh, architects think about their impact on the overall economy. So with, we saw the business level. Let's look at the economy-wide level. Well, it is well known that the work of architects and urban planners transforms landscapes and has profound economic and social impacts. We saw a bit about that in the previous presentation. From the economic perspective, this leads to extreme changes in the value of real estate assets, for example. And this sometimes doesn't take place through direct market mechanisms. It takes place through what we economists call positive and negative externalities. That is, effects on third parties that do not receive compensation through the market price system. Moreover, as the value of land changes, this is bound to have an effect on uh, social uh, conditions. It will make certain areas more affordable or other areas less affordable. It may lead to segregation, as it was pointed out before. Moreover, the nature of the buildings themselves, of interventions by architects, has social implications. It is not the same, for example, to create uh, a landmark building such as the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, or spend the same amount of money in the urban renewal of a downtown neighborhood. All this is well known. The question that I want to confront is, how can we economists help? Is the trade-off approach of any use? And I think it is. The decisions of architects and urban planners are multidimensional. They have to sit, satisfy simultaneously several goals. I have dared to classify them under five headings. First, I'm an economist, the pecuniary goal. That means achieving some sort of monetary target in terms of the cost, the money cost of the project. Second, the environmental goal. Setting targets in terms of scarce resources like clean water, clean air, 
which typically do not have a proper price in the market. Energy goals would be a subset of these. So we have pecuniary, environmental, social or humanistic goals, because more often than not, the architect intervenes in a certain area and modifies the social and human context, it can foster segregation or otherwise. Fourth, aesthetic uh, goals, the pure artistic value of the intervention. And last but not least, the usefulness of the intervention. Because in the end of the day, a building or an infrastructure serves a purpose. I don't know, maybe it's too daring for me, but it is clear, I believe, that the genius of architecture must be to solve the trade-off between the aesthetic and the usefulness goals. And that this can be done through creativity, through sheer creativity. But the trade-off between pecuniary and environmental goals, between pecuniary and social goals, between all the socioeconomic objectives and the non-economic objectives has to be confronted anyway. Creativity may alleviate them a bit, all those trade-offs. And it is certainly possible to come up with a building which is beautiful, useful, low-cost, environmental friendly. Like maybe the ones that we saw from Chile. But socioeconomic restrictions will not go away and economics can help highlighting what you give up when you make a choice. Let me also add that these trade-offs at the level of the specific interventions are of course also valid at the more aggregate level, and your talk before relates to that uh, more aggregate view. How do cities grow? Whether we foster compact or sprawled cities, the type of communications between them. Decisions such as do we build high-speed trains between large global metropolitan areas such as Madrid and Barcelona? Or do we foster a network of mid-sized cities with fast rail connections? These are, the, these are decisions with huge social and economic, and economic impacts and more often than not have been taken without any rigorous assessment of the problem. The issue becomes even more uh, arduous because we should factor in that at the end of the day, all these uh, actions are taken by a complex mix of private and public agents. It is not surprising that more often than not, decisions lack direction and even a minimal coherence. Since most of the audience is a Spanish, you just have to see Spanish urban planning, a real disaster. The economic trade-off approach should help decision-making by clarifying what are the foregone alternatives, the true cost, of any specific choice. Let me conclude. These days, it is fashionable to start or finish talks about economics and the crisis by quoting the admirable economist John Maynard Keynes. I will join the chorus with pleasure since I have been a great admirer of the British economist long before its current renewed popularity. Lord Keynes gave a lecture in Madrid about 80 years ago, it was exactly in June 1930, at the Residencia de Estudiantes. This was, as often with Keynes, a courageous and far-sighted lecture. By June 1930, the world economy was in the midst of a huge economic upheaval, barely starting the Great Depression. Then, Keynes reminded all of us that the final goal of human beings was the enjoyment of personal relations, the intellectual progress, the arts, and nature, not money. He correctly anticipated that the world would move on after the Depression for a long period of economic growth at about the rate that we have experienced since then. He also argued that despite this progress, a hundred years from then, we would still be a bit far away from the day where the economic problem would cease to be relevant. I am afraid that this is still true today and that it is advisable for all of us, including architects,
to understand and manage the trade-offs that are inherent to social interaction. Thank you. I really enjoyed the two preceding talks. And actually, this is different. So we've managed to have three speakers who all say something different. Um, I want to look at cities from the perspective of the global economy. That is a huge subject. Um, so I'm just going to touch on a couple of things. Y también no resisto hacer un saludo en español. Si lo que yo hablo se puede llamar español, con este acento argentino. Um, two theses, hypotheses, assertions that circulate uh, around the question of cities and globalization, and I want to contest both of them. So one is that cities are becoming more and more similar, and architects have something to do with that, that visual experience. Not, no architect present here. Um, the second proposition, which is linked to that first one, is that cities compete with each other. And they compete more and more the more globalized the world becomes. I think both propositions are incorrect. They're not 100% incorrect, but they are foundationally incorrect. They, they take you in the wrong direction. Now, I'm going to try to develop that very quickly. So let me start with the notion that Rather than thinking of the global economy and then all of these cities that want a piece of the pie, thinking about the multiplicity of global circuits that bring together different groups of cities, often around a given type of sector. Enormous differences, enormous uh, variability. Now, I have a few examples here. Mumbai is again there. You can see the urban age uh, trace. <laughs> so I love... For example, this particular case, this is point number four. Mumbai is today on a global circuit for commercial real estate development and investment that includes firms from cities as diverse as London and Bogota. Now, it includes all kinds of other, you know, there are about 70 <laughs> cities that are represented in this. Uh, or take the last point. Global commodity trading in coffee includes New York and Sao Paulo. New York, of course, doesn't grow one single bean of coffee. So that already gives you also a sense of the placement of cities vis-a-vis -vis very significant major global circuits. Um, now, there I have another, but let me just, oh, so gold, let me just mention gold. So if you look at gold as a financial instrument, Zurich and London are at the top. When you bring in gold as a commodity, Sao Paulo, Joburg, and Sydney kick in more circuits. If you bring the actual good, like gold jewelry, Mumbai and Dubai kick in as major places or all kinds of other places. But this gives you a sense of what we are actually alluding to when we talk about the global economy. We're talking about an enormous variety of circuits. Now, a critical point from the perspective of economics, the economy of cities, in crises, in non-crisis periods, you know, uh, because cities also are rather anarchic places. There is no central planner's imagination, I don't know if those two go together, but um, who could totally understand all the feedback loops that happen in a city. It's like fuzzy logic. You cannot. The system has intelligence built into it, so to speak. Um, now, critical what we can do, what planners can do, is to use the scale of the city and its multi-scalar character, the multiple ecologies that constitute urban space, to use that to add to the flexibility, by which I mean the capacity to adopt new, uh, you know, new, new practices, to develop new economic sectors, etc. That is why the informal economy, what Ricky was describing, is so important for large cities. Because informal economy, and today it's become very, very clear, is both an economy of survival, but it's also something else. It's also a creative informal economy. Think of Berlin, think of London. A lot of people who are architects, who are artists, who are designers, new media, video artists, etc., they begin informally because they don't know how it's going to go. And then they, they go on some, very often to become formalized. 
So, so the, the city has variability, flexibility, complexity, etc., and I think it is critical to use that. Now, besides the economic circuits, I always like to emphasize all the other circuits, because we all know that the city is an enormously complex city. So, and I like, this is just one example, but you can multiply it, because it gives you a sense of uh, globalities and how they get actually constructed around very specific issues and through very particular uh, sites. So NGOs fighting for rainforests in, uh, um, function in circuits that include Brazil and Indonesia, which are major rainforest sites, the global media centers of New York and London, and the major forestry companies and their headquarters, Oslo, London, and Tokyo. Now, very often the activists, they don't speak English, they're actually in the forest, you know, they're long chains. So this notion that globality is only getting constituted at the top is a mistake. In fact, when I look at the cities that I study, I see two particularly globalized sectors. One is at the top, the new transnational professional class, and the other one is at the bottom. You know, all kinds of low-wage artists, low-wage activists, or low-income, whatever, uh, of course, immigrants, also trafficked people, I mean, all kinds of things. Uh, by the way, something that many people are not aware of, but I think some practicing architects might run into is the fact that we have actually produced, I mentioned this in the context of the migration debates which are raging all over Europe, so it's a bit of a footnote here. Um, the fact that we have produced a subject with portable rights through WTO. So all the countries that are signatories actually have there are all the clauses, if you look at the WTO documents, I, I do recommend it actually, it's a bit big, but anyhow, you can take NAFTA, any partial trade things. But what you see there is that the professionals have all kinds of rights, except the right to vote in national elections, which mostly they don't have time and are not interested in anyhow. But the point here is that we have produced this, this subject with portable rights at the top, but not at the bottom but I would say then that there is hope. Um, now, at the bottom point here, that the other side of all of this also is also an increasing urbanizing of global networks. Now, a given city is going to be located on a multiplicity of circuits. If I were doing research in Madrid, my first research stop is to understand what are the multiple circuits, and a city like Madrid depending on the level of specialization that you take, is located on dozens and dozens of circuits. A lot of those circuits involve very different types of cities. A lot of them do include Buenos Aires, I know that. The connections between Madrid and Latin America, as you know better than I do, have really strengthened over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, now, these emergent intercity geographies begin to function as an infrastructure for multiple forms of globalization. One way of thinking about it is we are at the beginning point of a trajectory. There might be, you know, step regressions in that or there might be advances. And again, for me, globalization is multivalent. You know, there are some very, very, to me, unattractive and destructive things, global finance, which I was thinking of talking about tonight, but then I decided to focus on cities. And then there are very attractive things, you know, that, that um, often have to do with people projects. Um, now, each of these circuits, as I was saying, has specific cities. Now, here is where I want to really get at the heart of the matter, and that is, besides all these different circuits which produce a landscape where cities are not simply competing with all other cities, it's much messier and more complex, I think that one of the features that has gone under the radar in a lot of the commentary about globalization in cities is the fact that the specialized differences of cities matter. Now, all cities have a lot of routinized stuff. There is redundancy in the system. Redundancy does not necessarily mean competition. A lot of what is redundant, you know, your basic transport system, your basic food supply, you know, in local neighborhoods, etc. A lot of that is not necessarily part of you know, global circuits. Increasingly, it is, 
but it is not all of that. So redundancy is a different matter from competition. We tend to think if it's redundant, cities are competing with each other. Not necessarily. Now, I want to, to focus on one thing. In terms of specialized differences, one category, if you want, that captures this kind of stuff is the knowledge economy, a term that gets used a lot. I don't particularly like it. And I want to just give you an example. I'm not going to talk about Madrid because I just don't know it well enough. But if you take Sao Paulo, Chicago, and Shanghai, three industrial cities, um, they all have this long history of servicing major heavy manufacturing sectors. Um, their economic histories are very different from New York, London, or Rio de Janeiro, just to create the other, the partner city, if you want. Now, um, in your country, you know what Madrid's deep economic history is. It's probably different from Barcelona, different from some of the other cities. So, Now, the point that I'm trying to make here is that out of these specialized differences also comes a global division of functions. If you are a steel factory that wants to go global, you do not, in, say in the United States, you do not go to New York for your specialized servicing. New York doesn't know about steel. So there is a relationship between deep material histories and knowledge economy. That already signals the possibility, at least, of differentiated specialized economic histories. Um, and again, we could sort of you know, go through all kinds of uh, uh, examples, but I'm not going to do that now. One sort of as a provocation, given all this talk about the knowledge economy, which, which has fed also into the notion of that cities compete for each other, the, the very common notion is there is this knowledge economy and all cities compete to get a piece of it. And then you have, you have to do it all very nice so that the creative classes come. I think some of that sure is happening. Doing nice, getting creative classes, all very pretty, very good. I'm, I'm not against that at all. We are, of course, all creative classes. But, you know, the creative classes also include the financial experts and the whatever. Now, to me, this is a very troubling narrative. And so one little article that I wrote, partly as a, as a, as a provocation, I said, where does the knowledge, the knowledge economy come from? That every city that is complex that has an economy, you know, where you have internal tensions, where you have diversity, etc., actually produces part of what we then call the knowledge economy. So you've already noticed at first I contest the notion of the global economy and now the knowledge economy. Now, if you are a smallish city that doesn't have much complexity, then you are in that position that you want to get a piece of it. And then you compete maybe with other local cities in your region. Am I going to get that cultural center or are they going to get it? But major complex cities, global cities, and cities that are not necessarily global but that have complex economies, they actually contribute to make the knowledge economy. Now, I actually spend quite a bit of time, I can give you the full account, but quite a bit of time trying to apply this thesis I am an academic, you know, so we have time to do these extravagant studies that may lead to nothing. But in this case, I thought I actually got to something. Uh, this is not always the case. But um, trying to understand Chicago. Chicago and how it made a global, a part of a knowledge economy. And so Chicago is, of course, a city of huge manufacturing, huge heavy transport. Millions and millions of pigs, not a few pigs, millions, industrial production of pigs, industrial production of corn, I mean, that kind of stuff. Now, when you're producing a million pigs, the Adam Smith market, where the producers actually look at each other and say, aha, he's pricing the pig that price, I'll price it at this, that market doesn't work. Not when you are doing three million pigs. What happens? You actually have to know pigs. Not what your neighbor is doing, how is he, but the pig, and you have all the corn. I love this, you understand how I like the materiality that I'm bringing into the room. Imagine I'm talking about pigs, you know, in this setting. Cerdos, no se entiende lo que digo, no cerdos. So you have to know pigs. And so you have to, you establish your price by knowing pigs. And maybe having some sense of other markets, but you know, 
not the Adam Smith type of market, the village market, the farmer's market. And so you actually make a very complex evaluation. Out of that, of course, came the famous future, the derivative, the most complex financial instrument that we have. I mean, now there are derivatives on derivatives on derivatives. So that is one little way, there are many other ways, of explaining what I'm trying to say, that the deep economic history of a place actually is part of the production of what we call the knowledge economy. The trick is to switch, to extract the embedded knowledge, embedded in material practices, and make it into a knowledge instrument. Now, if you take that kind of analysis, you can recover the particularity of the economic, you know, uh, uh, sort of well, the specialized differences of cities. That is the, the point that I'm trying to make here. Um, now, so I hope that I made that point. Now I'm going to move to the next one. I am looking at my clock. So back to the question, the second proposition, that cities are becoming more and more similar. So with the first one, I've tried to sort of develop this notion that cities compete less with each other than we think. Now homogenization, because this, the, the discourse on, on the fact that globalization homogenizes cities is what also feeds this notion that cities compete with each other. Now, Question, what exactly does globalization homogenize when it comes to cities? I mean, homogenize all kinds of things, but let's just talk cities. And um, globalization homogenizes standards. This is clear for managing, for accounting, for financial reporting, for outsourcing, right? Manufacturing, I mean, we all know that the famous Boeing Dreamjet, Dreamliner, was delayed because they outsourced too much and there wasn't enough standardization in the global system of production. So when all the parts came, they couldn't put it together. And they're still struggling back there in, uh, in Seattle. It's a very interesting story, by the way. Now, but what it also homogenizes, and the architects and the engineers, etc., know that, is the standards for producing built environments. No matter how original, how brilliant, how different, the architect that is building state of the art, and I'm talking state of the art office buildings in the office, state of the art office district, state of the art airports, state of the art spaces of consumption, malls, whatever. Um, no matter how brilliant and original, that architect, that engineer, building engineer, has to, to some extent, respect the standardized standards for producing built environment. At the same time, the buildings, the kind of engineering that goes into it, to have a state-of-the-art office, this office uh, building today, is quite a mix of engineering, uh, uh, architecture, and throw into that the whole question of the greening of buildings. You know, there's a whole other form of knowledge that comes into the picture. Um, now, what happens then is that, this is my thesis, <coughs> that this type of built environment does no longer talk the language of buildings as buildings did in the 1960s. An office building was a box that said, I'm about office work, and, uh, and it was, and most of it, in fact, routinized clerical jobs. The office building of today does not tell you really what happens in there. But again, that only you can only say that if you take a very sort of a refined, specialized level, you know, to look at things. Uh, so take China. Shenzhen, Hong Kong, and Shanghai are the three major financial centers. They're very different, but the state-of-the-art office building in the financial center is quite similar. New York and Chicago, the two leading financial centers, and maybe here it would be Madrid and Barcelona, the state-of-the-art office building to handle financial activities is very similar. But the kind of financial activity that is done is quite different. That then extends to the kind of specialized legal, specialized accounting, etc. But again, this is looking at a very specialized level uh, for sort of the, the economy. So for me then, the buildings today are an infrastructure. By that I mean necessary but indeterminate. It has to meet those standards, but how exactly it's going to get used in an economy which in these complex cities is marked by increasing levels of specialized difference 
That's an open question. So what we have, possibility, is architecture, this, this state-of-the-art sort of uh, architecture, uh, which is also very corporate very often, you know, uh, produces a global architectural vocabulary. And that sort of leads people to think a bit about the homogenizing. But that's a flaw. Me tengo que acabar. Sí. Ay. But that's sort of a flawed inference because actually how those buildings are getting used is very specific and varies enormously. That is a second way of saying that this particular period does not necessarily uh, homogenize the urban economies, even as it homogenizes the standards of production for state-of-the-art spaces, build spaces. I was going to show a bit more, but I'm going to end. So I hope that I made clear my two uh, main theses, that cities are now coming back, final sentence, in the context of this economic crisis, cities have to use their specialized difference rather than being terrified by the fact of competition, etc. And, and using their specialized differences also means recovering material histories, recovering the role of sectors that now are not seen as very fancy, going beyond, in other words, the knowledge economy, recovering all the different working classes, the types of neighborhoods, it's the social reproduction circuits, of those workers. And then you begin to understand where the economy of the city is. Thank you very much. To ask uh, Norman to, to give a first uh, reaction to the three presentations uh, Ricky's, uh, Jordi's, and Saskia. <laughs> Easy task. <laughs> yes. well, to break the ice. I'm trying to think where to start. <laughs> um, I mean, I find them uh, all very insightful. Um, and quite interestingly, I think some of the subjects in the, in, in the widest sense uh, has the potential for a rather interesting degree of overlap with, uh, with tomorrow night and sustainability, which will <coughs> inevitably focus on cities. Um, so I think there's a very interesting transition from tonight uh, through to tomorrow. Um, I think the, uh, one of the things that certainly came out this evening was the important link between the infrastructure of cities and the architecture of the individual buildings, the interdependence uh, between those. And, um, and I think the other theme, uh, really, whether it was in terms of Hordi, <clears throat> um, as a kind of uh, the interest of the corporate client in terms of the profession <clears throat> or whether it's the uh, global networks of Saskia um, or whether it's the uh, release from poverty <clears throat> which Ricky highlighted um, the common theme is really that everybody out there wants the most for the least and um, and I would venture to say that there really are no exceptions to that. There may be a lot of illusions, um, but the reality is um, it's actually a very competitive world. And everybody is seeking, uh, however you might define it, and that's a subject in itself, but they're seeking to get the maximum value for their resources or the maximum value for their for their money. And really, I suppose that, um, that what comes through in terms of the intelligence that's been deployed through the uh, three speakers is that resources really is not just money. It's money. Time also is money. Um, uh, but creative energy is the prime resource of all. So it's how wisely you spend those uh, resources. <coughs> um, Mindful of the fact that there's probably in the audience really quite a, uh, a number of a younger generation of, of, of architects, I think that it was very interesting the way that you touched on, and a subject very close to my own heart, is um, 
you know, should, uh, should these disciplines be part of an educational process or should they be put aside on the basis that, um, that the learning period is an opportunity free from any restraints to exercise creativity because you will eventually in the real world uh, cope with that and therefore you shouldn't be constrained. I think that's um, myself, I think is absolute nonsense. I think it's rubbish um, because the resources that are available for a project are one of the <coughs> most important generators. And if I think back to those architects in the past whose work I've admired, um, whether that's the, um, the incredible church in the center of Covent Garden, which is just a great barn of, um, of, a, of a building, whether it's one of Wren's exquisite silhouette uh, buildings. If you really look at some of these buildings, you realize they've really had the screws put on them by their clients. And they've had to be clever enough and creative enough to be able to de determine what the priorities architecturally are. So I think that the notion that, um, that being disciplined about cost is therefore somehow anti-creative. I think it is exactly the polar opposite. I think that you know, the generators for fantastic architecture, incredible design, one of those generators is you know, the funds that are available. And the sooner that anybody who really wants to make great architecture realizes that and turns that to creative advantage is a very, very important step. It seems to me that um, that really in terms of the economics, and we've touched on the economics of the big picture, the cities, the interdependencies. <clears throat> but seeing as we're looking at this from the designer's point of view, and I say the designer because the designer embraces a whole range of professions from engineering to architecture and the many other consultancies who become involved and interact and the leadership um, behind that. You can say that really um, there's a responsibility to look after the economics of your client or putting it in, in more direct language, uh, your client's resources, the money that your client has. And you also have a responsibility to look after your own. I think that socially uh, Ricky's point that <coughs> drawing attention to to the wider um, world of architecture beyond those individual buildings, but you know the uh, the slums, the transition from poverty. I thought it was, I mean, incredibly eye-opening. The 7,500, you know, in other words, you could get a shack, uh, or you could get an incredibly civilized uh, dwelling. So. Um, <clears throat> you know, the last of my sketches on the wall, and I mentioned this briefly last night, is for the school in Sierra Leone. And if you really want to make a difference to the education of, you know, of, of, of poor children out there, then the difference is how much, you know, just whether the school is affordable at that very, very basic level, you know. So it all hinges on that. Um, so if you really want to make a a difference socially in terms of the big picture out there, then it starts, it starts with the economics. Um, and, and obviously that's the means to the social ends. Um, I think I've touched on the fact that if you want to be more creative as, as architects in the design sense, in terms of the quality of the architecture, then I think that you're in a better position to be able to do that, better to be able to deliver high quality design, if you're mindful of the economics uh, behind it. <clears throat> if you want to stay in business, either if you're part of somebody else's team or you're creating your own team, your own practice, if you want a future and you don't look after your client's money, you're going to be out of business in no time at all <laughs> because <clears throat> it's never talked about, certainly not in a school of architecture, <clears throat> 
And any architects who get together over drinks and ex exchange pleasantries about design will never ever talk about it either. But if you design the most fantastic office building and it wins every design award in sight, um, and you're being considered in a competitive environment for a project, there's a network, not your, well, it's your global network. It's the telephone, it's the email. You know, how did that architect deliver? We know he did a great building. We know that it's had a lot of publicity. How good was he in terms of controlling costs? If there's a negative answer to that, watch out. You're unlikely to be on the final shortlist. Um, if you want to stay in business looking after your own money, then um, if you actually do your research, you'll find there's a very long list of architects who've gone bankrupt and have had to find investors to rescue them. And then they are really constrained. They are really limited because they're beholden to somebody else who's looking over their shoulder. They don't have the, uh, the creative uh, freedom. And <clears throat> again, something else that is never talked about, um, you have an international competition for a project and the envelopes are finally opened. Somebody chooses the winner. Be assured that along the line, there is another envelope, there is another conversation, and it's called fees. So in terms of delivering quality, you have to be really quite competitive. But of course, as I started, it's a competitive world out, world out there. So I think there are certain threads which link all these um, wide-ranging subjects uh, together. Thank you very much, Norman. Um, of course, uh both Ricky and, uh, and Saskia developed a more global picture and uh, talk more about macro issues. But it was Jordi who described in more detail the economics, uh, sort of the business uh, nature of an architectural firm. Could you perhaps develop on that following uh, Norman's last uh, commentaries? On the business, at the business level? Yes, yes, the fact that you have to take care of your clients' money, but also of your own uh, business structure if you want to survive in this competitive world of ours? Uh, well, I, I fully agree with the statements that were made uh, a minute ago by, by Mr. Forster. Uh, from the point of view of the sustainability of the business, uh, you should make sure that your client is satisfied and within the budget and the time. I didn't mention that, but time is money. It's part of the equation that has to be incorporated. Uh, also, I didn't have time to elaborate more on that, but uh, even environmental goals that should be factored into the, into the equation should be transformed into uh, money. Uh, I was fascinated by reading about your project at the Rice Stack, which has an environmental, a very strong environmental component. Uh, uh, some, somewhere I read that you mentioned that the accountants were in agreement uh, well, I'm not sure about the accountants. I would prefer that the economists were in agreement <laughs> in the sense that not only uh, the flows of energy were taken into consideration, but also the external cost uh, that uh, producing energy involves for the economy are also taken into consideration. When I argued before that uh, architecture and urban planning should take into account environmental goals, I mean being explicit, and this is a topic for, I guess, tomorrow's debate, about what is the equivalent in euros of having a slightly less polluted air, or a slightly less polluted uh, water. And I think that that is true at the aggregate level. It must also gradually come true at the level of a specific architectural projects. I think it, it's quite interesting. We were able to be as radical as we were on the Reichstag in terms of achieving um, a building uh, which is virtually zero carbon um, from 96% discharge into the atmosphere down to 4% with no dependence on fossil fuels, renewable energies, um, uh, biomass, uh, photovoltaics, aquifers. <coughs> We did that through the economic argument and 
I think it was a factor in terms of our winning the competition, in addition to the architecture, um, when as a small group and the three of us, and Stefan, one of that group, is here in the audience, and we'll remember that, um, that we were confronted by a sea of faces. There were the key jury members, and behind them, their advisors. And we said, tell us, how much does it cost to run your home? And they all looked very puzzled. And we said, the home, your Reichstag, you understand. And then what, there, was silence. there was a great buzz of... They didn't know. So we told them, and we told them the implications of the cost of running their building into the future and suggested that if they couldn't take an, uh, a sustainable approach for moral reasons, then they should do it for Deutschmarks. And we argued with the economics as well as the, the architects. And that's one of the factors that we were able to achieve such a highly sustainable building. And they loved it, and it's great, but they didn't actually ask for it, but they got it, and they sanctioned it. I should say, though, that uh, the argument goes also the other way, meaning that sometimes some environmentally friendly uh, parts of buildings are not economic, even if taking the right prices for the environment. So sometimes things are done, which I believe are outrageously costly, and those resources could be used elsewhere for social problems in other parts of the city or for other projects. So that's, that's the key, one of the keys of the argument that I made. Let's put them in, and for good or for bad sometimes. Well, if, if we do not jump into tomorrow's uh, uh, subject <coughs> of sustainable uh, can I, can I architecture cities, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this, I'm very interested in the subject, and it was um, positioned a bit in terms of a building. And I'm very interested in, and I'm very much looking forward to your talk. I won't be here, but I will find out about your talk. Um, Professor Girard Day, I'm sure that you all know. Uh, and that's the question, how does the city as a complex space with multiple social ecologies, how can it be made to work to produce a more environmental city? And so one of the things that I'm working on is sort of there are two complex parallel systems. One is made up of the multiscalar social ecologies of cities, and the other one is the multiscalar ecologies of nature. And so how can we have a very complex understanding of how they could interact? So for instance, just to mention one item, you know, one notion is what can we move back to nature? And I don't know how the economics come into that picture. Uh, in other words, w there is now enough science, scientific knowledge, that we know that we can use bacteria to make buildings, you know, as they call them, self-healing, you know, that they don't produce gases. I mean, I don't know that the applications are all there in place. Uh, there are multiple ways in which we can delegate back to nature things that we now do with man-made chemicals that are toxic, you know, etc. But then the effect, and here's where I want to get to the cities, the effect is a far more distributed system. All, if for it to really work, means that all buildings have to be, you know, we have to maximize that. And so you actually, my fantasy, it may be a fantasy, is that if we work at this environmentally sustainable city, we also produce a more democratic, more distributed space. And I'm not sure then how the economics, the traditional economics works there. It may actually be a very a qualitatively different situation, you know, and more people will have to participate. There's just a bigger involvement also of citizens, you know, to be aware of this. So to, to me, at the level of the city, the ecological project becomes truly interesting in terms of also its political and social uh, consequences. I, I, the, the, you made a very, very fundamental point, very important point, and that was <coughs> the importance of flexibility. Um, and the way in which an earlier generation of buildings has been incredibly adaptable to change. Um, and, um, and again, there's a very interesting economic thread that moves through that. Um, and again, I think this comes back to the creative spark. I mean, um, if you are a client, 
and you are interviewing a designer, an architect, um, who demonstrates that maybe if you spend a little more money in a particular direction, that you have more potential for change and flexibility, you know, that is a bankable asset and, and opens up interesting design but challenges. I think the, the, the really key issue... this point, but at the same <coughs> time, before you answer, I want to simply do not forget to comment on the eight floors. Two? No, you, you, you made a, pro yes. a slightly your provocative uh, yeah. presentation in which you more or less implied that, that the high rises would could not be adapted. No, I, so, don't, I, I, I don't think, I don't think Ricky no, was. Um, no, I was why, why, why don't you let Ricky... Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, no my, 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 the point I was trying to make okay, didn't make it clearly. Point clear. <coughs> and was, I mean, I'm always fascinated by what Saskia says, and today was even more fascinated because I disagree with one of the points you were making about homogeneity and sort of that there, there's a new um, nearly generation of state-of-the-art offices which, which are controlled. I would say the more I go around cities, the more out of date they seem to be. And to go, to, to go back to Norman and to your point, I think a lot of this depends on who is behind it as client, and you were very clear about that, and what their return on investment time frame is. Because Norman's just said, I mean, if you're a company which is sitting in Bogota, let's say you use that example, which is investing in Shanghai, and wants its return on investment in five years and then out, they will not design a flexible building. They will design a building which sells that week according to whatever the estate agents say. And they're off. And they're off, <laughs> right? And the best thing they can do is sell it on to someone else in two years' time. There are whole parts of London that many of us who live there were designed 200 years ago with a view that they remain for 999 years with the same client. 999 years, right? So, now, they have inbuilt flexibility. And I think uh, I'm, I'm not as, as optimistic as you are in, in these, seeing this new landscape because so much I learned from you of the investment comes from a relatively limited group of companies whose interests are much more short term than perhaps we would like. And I think that's a, no, a, a dilemma in terms of trade. Just to clarify, one very particular segment of the built environment of cities, the state-of-the-art office district. In other yeah. words, that's a very particular, and they have to meet certain, that's not a quickie building that you can build in the periphery or, you know, for some, I don't know. Those, those have very strict standards. Mm -hmm. But my, my answer would be that, yes. you know, state-of-the-art probably means going back to some very simple things, and your Hearst building shows it. Narrow, you can open windows. Tall is fine, but dense and close. Th those would be the sort of Three or four things. Hmm? But I agree that it is not necessarily a desirable for the longer term. Yeah. I agree. I'm just, you know, absolutely, yes. Yeah. I'm just talking about so, one particular so element. Well, Ricky, then then I, I misunderstood you when you seemed to imply that the high rises were not flexible. No, I'm saying if you take a canary wharf like, right. very fat, deep building, which is 45 meters deep, right? when in 1990 we had the last recession, which lasted more than this one. Uh, and they had built new buildings in other parts of London or elsewhere in Europe in the States. Many of those buildings, with the, with the drop in demand in offices, mm -hmm. lawyers, uh, were uh, able to immediately adapt to housing, right? Because you, you could open with These are tall buildings and narrow. The ones that can't be retrofitted, is what I would say, are those deep, inflexible structures. That's what I was getting at. And most of them are buildings which stand in space and are surrounded by car parking, I mean, to simplify <laughs> that sense. And what we've left out a bit from this discussion, because there's a limit to what we can talk about, is the politician here and the governance which lies behind many of the decisions that we're making. What is the legal and political framework which then allows some of the sort of uh, economic uh, visions that uh, you, you, you discussed, uh, allows them to happen or not happen? And I think that, that aspect seems to be critical, and Barcelona but, being the no, wonderful... Let, let, let me ask but, something about Barcelona, because you have been an advisor in Barcelona, and Barcelona <laughs> turned from the continuity of the urban uh, uh, grid to isolated buildings as a way of growing. And this is something that we have uh, been able to, uh, uh, to be um, 
in, 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 a, in the last uh, 15 years. So Barcelona took a turn towards the, sort of to the isolated uh, <coughs> buildings, and, and I wonder whether but, this was something but which I think was it fueled was by economic with reasons. A, within a, an overall framework of a, of a dense and compact city. So it was not a break, a total break from the previous past. Let me add on that discussion about flexibility, which I find it very interesting, because in the modern economy, flexibility has a value. So those, those of us economists that tend to think that the market works in general, uh, tend to believe that if flexibility is so important, developers, real estate uh, companies, will recognize it and incorporate it into their uh, business plans. That is to say, the value of a building, which can be retrofitted easily, will go up. And uh, if that's such an important issue, and it is, I believe that, uh, to a certain extent, new buildings will already incorporate the ability to change as uh, the needs will change in the future. You, you, you have discussed, you have opened our eyes to the trade-offs and, and brought sustainability into the debate. We have two uh, uh, of the speakers of, of, of tomorrow, and I think it's a, it's a good moment to give the, the, uh, uh, the word to the floor and uh, perhaps ask them to make statements. I would ask any of you that uh, intervenes to say your name and, and uh, your qualification, if they may say so. Well, I could make one or two points. Maybe the first one would be that uh, um, some economists, particularly very well-known uh, former World Bank economists, said that the economy is the wholly owned subsidiary of the world's ecology and not the other way around. So a discussion on economics really does have to start with a discussion of the economics of nature. And certainly in the discussion about the future of cities, this is a very topical issue indeed, particularly in a year when climate change is top of the agenda in terms of international discussions, uh, culminating in a conference in Copenhagen in December where some 50,000 people will be trying to make sense of our development uh, perspectives and trajectories of urbanization, of ever greater industrialization, <coughs> how can we square the circle of assuring that cities which are massively dependent on non-renewable resources, I mean take London for instance, London requires every week the equivalent of two super tankers of oil to keep it going. Now that is a non-renewable resource, so is non London therefore a non-renewable city? And what does that mean for uh, the retrofitting of existing cities? That is a really critical issue, how we can retrofit cities that are dependent, uh, as they are today, on fossil fuels uh, and have grown on the back of a massive increase in the use of fossil fuels. How can we retrofit those to run on renewable energy instead? So I think this is uh, an ecological issue, but just as much an economic issue as well. Will you comment on that, Norman? I think, I think let's have a... Oh, you, you, I, I, so we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll have more, more uh, voices from the floor, yeah? Good, Good evening. Um, my name's Matthew Streets. I'm the CFO, Chief Financial Officer at Foster's. Um, trying to pick up a theme on, on economics and picking up Jordi's five points, return, environmental, social, uh, humanistic, the aesthetic and usefulness. Looking at the panel where we have, a, as I understand it, a high density person, social person, and then economics, where would you put the weighting in this financial model? Because I think it, as you've touched on as well, the, the economic value doesn't necessarily accrue to the person who's spending the money, as in it can go to a nation rather than an individual. And in that context, we're doing a project, Mazdar, which maybe <coughs> does do something like that, brings all those together. So I'd be interested in, in the panel's view as where would you put the weighting, as it were, in that equation where all the pieces aren't even, you know, the variables aren't even necessarily independent. Uh, if I may start, uh, first, one, one quick reaction to, to the first uh, statement. Uh, in fact, Nicholas Stern, the previous uh, chief economist of the World Bank and the author of the well-known report that you probably referred to him, 
who was in Barcelona two weeks ago, he didn't say that the global economy was the subsidiary of the global ecology, <laughs> although he certainly thinks that. Um, but I am not sure. I am not sure about that statement. Because at the end, both the global ecology and the global economy are subsidiary of the global society. And, and the point that I was trying to make before is that we don't really need pure air. We don't really need pure water, 100% pure, while we have people living in the suburbs of Caracas the way they live. So the point is society is first, and maybe we have to pollute a bit to increase the well-being of many people in the world who still are uh, behind, who are below $2 per day. Now, this brings me to the second question. How do you value those conflicting goals? Well, I'm not saying that we can put always a value, but recognizing that they conflict and recognizing that when you choose, you do not undertake other projects that affect certain parts of the population already makes you think twice about the decision that you take. Then comes the harder question of how do you value the well-being of that part of society relative to this other part of society? East London versus West London. Well, you have to do it. If you don't do it, implicitly you are doing it by taking a decision. I have to say that in the case of the environment and energy, we gradually come closer to giving a money value to that cleaner. There is the market for carbon emissions, which already is putting a value on, uh, on those pollutants. Admittedly, that value depends on the initial allocation of permits across the world. If we were to allocate different the permits, the value would be different. But that's one step, at least, in recognizing the scarcity and the conflicting goals. Vic, would you comment or um, ask? Well, I think that we are uh, confronting the particularity of this epoch. Some foundational change has happened that we cannot capture, we cannot govern with the instruments that we have thus far developed. And it has to do with the environment. I mean, the science is there, etc. So then the question for me is, how can this, and I'm talking about, we really have two crises, a financial crisis, I've done a lot of work on the financial crisis, and we have um, an environmental crisis, let me put it in those terms. Does this combination produce an opening? Does the fact that $50 trillion, that's the equivalent of global GDP, has been lost in value? Some people ask, where did that money go? But it didn't go anywhere. It just Does the fact that we have a shrinking economy, <laughs> you know, everybody's talking about this. The financial service firms are making money again but unemployment keeps growing. We have shrinking economy. Does this produce a space? And then I think of in the addressing the environmental question on a complex level, all kinds of things, like you have been brilliant at this in your career, you know, so embedding it, wiring it into. And if we do that, everybody would be employed, not necessarily for money, you know, but if like Austin, Austin, in the heart of Texas, I'm talking Austin, the United States, Texas is the most regressive, I hope I don't offend anybody, but how they managed to be so regressive is extraordinary. Austin launched a little weatherizing, weatherizing of homes for low income areas, giving a bit of money, shifting it back to the people themselves and the little firms in the neighborhoods. Well, that does more than weatherizing homes. It mobilizes people. And I think that we're at that juncture. Now, we have complex economic systems. This, I'm not talking about a revolution a la Francaise, n'est-ce pas? We run the Bastille and no, no. It's multiple things, but that is sort of my reading of where are you, of where we're at. Now, that is a novel kind of complexity. <coughs> there is a field, ecological economics, very obscure field, brilliant, mixing, really using scientific knowledge that we have from biology, et cetera, in order to understand how do we address economic issues. It's different from the kind of next turn type of economics, you know, which is also part, I think, of the picture. So that is sort of my, it's the beginning of a new trajectory that coexists 
with older trajectories that will continue for a while at least. If I, if I may add just a little bit on the financial crisis, about the 50, 50 trillion, yeah. just, just a very quick note, if you allow a, a humble economist. Yeah, yeah. Um, they just went from one pocket to another pocket. No, no, so no. One, one, thing about, well, one thing about the financial crisis is that now we have huge unemployment, we have a bust, we, we had a boom. We have long, very large employment, now we have large unemployment. And in the middle, the bubble has created a huge transfer of wealth from some, from some people to other people. Yeah, the yeah. people that jumped out of the bubble before, before it burst. Sure. So it's a, it's a very bad social outcome. So the 50 trillion are there. But the they move from one pocket to the other. No, no, no. But not, no, no. <laughs> just, just, little, uh, little, little. I agree with you, but I, <laughs> no. I thought that no, the 50 trillion have not evaporated. No, no, no. We had 650 trillion in valuation, you know, which is 14 times global GDP. Now we're down to 50, 550. That's a value that never really existed in any concrete well, shape, right? That's, so that is why it went nowhere because it just, that's, it just that's you know, point. shrank. <laughs> so we agree, I think. I'd like to be a little bit more optimistic uh, <laughs> in terms of conclusion because, because uh, about all the issues that we're addressing because ultimately, uh, I mean, I, I know what Herbert is saying. We shouldn't start the conversation which is going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, Herbie, even though some cities like London are bad news in terms of ecological footprint, I think non-cities are worse than cities. So yeah, I think, yeah, that's right? So, sure. So I think if we take all the parameters we've talked yeah. talking about, um, bringing people together is good for agglomeration economies. That's where people do business, and the closer they are together, the better they do business. I mean, there's no evidence of the opposite. Right? Um, bringing people together, if in a well-designed way, with people of difference, as Richard, your husband, tells us, actually creates exactly the sort of integration and complexity of society that we all need in order to go forward. At the environmental level, if well designed and supported by good public transport systems, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, cities can be incredibly efficient. So in that sense, there's one agenda emerging here, which does cut across all, th all three, which is towards greater density, but better planned, um, and giving attention to you know, all the issues that we see around this world and even in this city. And I would say the downside of, is that a lot of what is happening in the emerging world, which I discussed at the beginning of my talk, is going in exactly the opposite direction. And that's the biggest problem of those of us who are trained in the economies by the sort of uh, cities and institutions you've referred to, are dumping the past ideologies into the world which is emerging. That's, yes. That, for me, is the massive problem and a problem that Norman and I have discussed in the past of education. Because who, who, where, why stop thinking intelligently when you have to design something in Seoul? If there is any, any uh, intervention from the floor, please uh, raise your hand and we'll be happy to bring a microphone. Please say your name, please. And, and your position. Uh, my name is Juan Manuel Giral de Arquer. I am university lecturer in uh, Barcelona, Barcelona University. Uh, in Spain, more than in other countries, one of the main causes of the crisis had been to put uh, building and the specul speculation aroused by, by it as the main uh, force for the economic growth. My question is, was that, uh, especially to uh, Lord Foster, uh, I'm asking that, and to the other uh, participants, was that uh, a big mistake to, to give that importance to building in the economic growth and in the future? Should, should we redefine the part of building and, of course, if it could be cut, the speculation, which I doubt that, uh, to have a, a different place in the economic growth, or can architecture continue to help economic growth, but not making to depend the whole 
of the uh, economic growth around the building. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I think those who design buildings and those who make buildings respond to the framework, which is um, the political agenda, if you like. And I think that one of the challenges in terms of economic stability and indeed how, uh, you know, your point about how you retrofit uh, <coughs> cities um, and you're talking about the, um, the North European traditional uh, city. Um, I think it's, it, it does come back to the importance in the political domain of well-informed um, decisions which are long-term in their thinking. And the problem is that um, the, the poli most political machines are conditioned by short-term political expediency. <clears throat> I think there are a lot of lessons from those emerging economies. I mean, for example, if you look at the way that um, cities like Hong Kong or uh, <coughs> Singapore, Beijing, or whatever, the way in which they handle um, the growth industry of aviation, there is an extraordinary clarity of thinking. And very, um, by comparison, if you compare, for example, uh, Heathrow, or you compare a typical terminal, the length of time that is taken and the kind of band-aid mentality. Uh, I mean, the fact that there is an endless debate about whether there should be an extra runway at Heathrow ignores totally the fact that if the extra runway was there already, there would still be a major problem with Heathrow and you will eventually have to close it down or accept that you have to you know, create a massive new airport at some sensible place where, you know, the final approach doesn't go over one of the most densest uh, cities in, in the world. And what is interesting is that we delude ourselves um, that the decision-making in those other economies is because they are less democratic or they don't have unions. And that is absolute nonsense. If you actually analyze the realities, if you set aside the time, even for a public inquiry of, say, five years and perhaps a year to get planning permission, they still run circles around it in terms of their, their decision making. So I think that the, the, the roundabout answer to your question is that you have to have well-informed government policies which are, in terms of education, informed and therefore, I think that one of the advantages in Spain, more than most countries, is that there is a tradition of the architectural professions infiltrating into the political bodies. And I think that that is another important point in terms of education. In other words, um, the architect at any point in society is only as powerful as the level of ad advocacy by that architect, because the architect can't tell anybody to do anything. So I think that there's a very important position for the architect to be at a high level of political decision making, mindful of the importance of the economics. Um, so it is that need for holistic thinking. So our bubble was political? In the end or not? Yeah, and, and I tied with, with your remarks, um, the huge boom of construction in Spain is the result of the fact that neither democracy nor the market system are perfect systems. They are the best systems, but not perfect. The boom was the result of the entrance of Spain in the euro zone and the huge decline of interest rates which made it affordable to many Spaniards to request more buildings. There the supply came. This could have been stopped politically 
But in a democracy, that's tough. You get re-elections every four years. There was a political measure that you could have taken to stop the boom, which was, for example, to diminish the favorable fiscal conditions of home ownership that we have in Spain. Actually, to eliminate them, say in 2003, who is the brave politician that does that? <laughs> that will not happen. Let me, on the positive side, say that architecture does contribute to the growth of the economy and to the productivity of the economy. I spent a couple of years living in Belgium. Now I live in Spain. I can tell you the physical capital stock, the buildings, the infrastructure of Spain is a platform of future productivity if we use it well. We have a renewed capital stock that other countries do not have. And maintaining a renewed capital stock in terms of buildings and infrastructure is a good asset for the overall economy. Would you make some commentaries on Spain to close the session as uh, the discussion has uh, arrived to our shores? <laughs> you know uh, Spain well, you Barcelona particularly, and Saskia has given a lot of its examples. She says she doesn't know uh, Madrid well, but I, I, hopefully she will also comment something. Ricky. Well, I think, of course, the, the one thing you have in this country is, is two extraordinary assets. One is you have, leaving aside this temporary blip <laughs> over the last 20, not last year, last 20 Ten years, years that, you know, you, you, the difficulties that you described are understood. Over the last generations, hundreds of years, you have an extraordinary urban fabric anywhere across your country, anywhere. You can go in any region and find cities of a beauty and intensity of, yes. of which are rare to find anywhere else, else in the world. And that for an Italian is quite difficult to make a really state. I think at another level you also have a design profession which I think is extremely sophisticated. If I walk around the city today as I did this morning, you see a, a lot of what I would call architecture of radical normality. It's just background normal stuff. And it looks absolutely good and it's designed by probably architects from the 30s, from the, from the 50s or now. There, there is this ability to also be modest. And I think that in the context of the bigger issues of which Norman described of scarcity of resources today, that's exactly where I think creativity is, is, is going to happen. I mean, it's not by chance that in, 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 in our country, architects who uh, for 10 years never worked, like David Chipperfield, let's say, an architect who does square buildings with flat roofs, right? <laughs> same, same, as opposed to something else. Right? Um, <laughs> no, 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 he'd be very happy. No, no, he'd, be extreme, he'd say that maybe that's too much. Has come back in vogue. I mean, that sort of a, a, a more reticent architecture, which is completely uh, not, not meaning that it, it, it's, it doesn't have a creative dimension. And I think in this country, you have that depth, uh, which is uh, refreshing and something that one can build on. Uh, and I think the dialogues have always been much more open to some of the issues we're discussing today. The schools of architecture that I've been involved in seem to be at least a bit more open to some of these uh, issues and therefore I feel relatively positive. Well, we need some encouragement in these dark times. Saskia, please. Well, first I want to say that Madrid and Barcelona son de una belleza extraordinaria. <laughs> but now, let me just give you a datum, very interesting datum. So we have been doing this huge study, 75 cities globally, over 60 variables, measures, not opinions, makes a lot of difference. And uh, what we have seen is a real shift towards a growing importance of smaller European cities, not just Paris and London. And just to give you a, a, an interesting point, I think, um, about five years ago in this study, we've done two replications. In this study, uh, Los Angeles was number 10 in the global hierarchy. Now, it's a very aggregated, you know, there's a lot of variability once you disaggregate. And in, the la in 2008, Madrid was number 10, where, and Los Angeles had dropped to 17, and a bunch of other smaller European cities had come up, Copenhagen, Zurich, etc. 
So what I am seeing is Madrid as part of this sort of geopolitical restructuring, rather gradual but assuming a firmer geography, if you want now, towards a multipolar world. Yes, there is Asia, we all talk about Asia, but US cities are losing ground. And the smaller European cities, that is what I find so interesting, are gaining ground. And I think that that's a very interesting proposition. You know? So it's a very multi-sided global world, and it's not just Asia. And if you look at uh, some of these very specialized studies, the two most attract, now these are interviews and surveys of, of investors and, and firms that might locate. The two <coughs> most attractive polls are Europe and some parts of Asia. And Europe, certain parts of Europe. So I think that that's a very interesting thing. Since in it Europe, is what, in yeah. Europe, they keep thinking that, you know, there is Asia and then there is, and no, actually, it's very important. <laughs> So I would ask uh, uh, Norman to end up uh, with a statement of what to Spain or Madrid. Well, we've been, <coughs> I mean, we've been very fortunate in the sense that our introduction as, as architects um, into Spain was um, through infrastructure. And, um, and I think that uh, it, it's very important that architects are involved in infrastructure. And I'm always making the point that infrastructure is arguably more important than the buildings which the infrastructure actually links together. So whether it's the communication tower in Barcelona or the metro system in, in Bilbao, I think that Spain has an extraordinary advantage in terms of the quality of urban life. And when you talk about you know, the smaller cities, I did a, a pilgrimage uh, um, uh, with a bicycle to Santiago de Compostela and linked through every night in a different city. And, um, and a lot of these cities don't, you know, it's a point that, that, that you made about the smaller European city. Uh, in, in a way, Barcelona, Madrid, uh, fantastic. Although even I think that probably the residents of both those cities take for granted the extraordinary qualities that, uh, that they're privileged to have in terms of um, uh, the fact that they're pedestrian friendly, they have good quality of p public transport, uh, the mixture of uses. They're all the characteristics you would describe if you tried to describe your optimistic hope for the city of the future. So I think that, you know, you're um, incredibly well placed. I, I mean, maybe I do a version of, uh, of your uh, thing about Keynes. There's hope for all of us now. <laughs> okay, so it's uh, a very good uh, quote to end uh, today's session. Thank you very much all for coming. Thank you.